Uh, my name is Peter Hall, and it's an enormous pleasure uh, to be able to introduce uh, Miguel Centeno, whom I imagine everyone in this room uh, already knows. And in particular, I want to welcome him back to Harvard. And I say welcome him back to Harvard because after uh, graduating in economics from ISEG Technical University of Lisbon, uh, and then taking two masters in applied mathematics and economics, uh, he came to Harvard and did a PhD in economics in uh, graduating, I think, in 2000, if I remember right. Uh, so um, this is really a homecoming, and we're so glad to have you uh, here with us uh, again. Um, in, uh, just to show that it's possible to graduate from Harvard and do relatively well in the world, um, he went on to be a, a professor at ISEG in uh, Lisbon. Uh, and um, uh, Mr. Santeno is the author of uh, multiple articles and books on um, labor economics, econometrics, uh, contract theory, microeconomics, and the like. He joined Portugal's central bank in 2000, uh, and uh, in that uh, uh, role, he was assistant director of the central bank economics department from 2004 to 2013. I just... Uh, I spoke to one of my colleagues, Jeff Frieden, who uh, recalled uh, seeing you at a conference in Portugal where I gather they were demonstrating outside the building as a result of uh, what the central bank was doing at the time. So we, if we could have produced some demonstrators here to make you feel uh, comfortable, we would have, but we haven't been able to do that. Uh, Mr. Santana also directed the Macroeconomic Statistics Department uh, a work group in uh, the Statistics Council between 2007 and 2013. Uh, he served as a member of the Economic Policy Commission of the European Commission between 2004 and 2013, and he did many other things besides, which I'm not going to elaborate here. But of course, um, very importantly, in November 2015, uh, he became a finance minister uh, of the Portuguese Republic. And uh, just this year, uh, he was chosen as president of the Eurogroup uh, and chairman of the Board of Governors of the European Stability Mechanism. In other words, uh, he occupies an enormously important position in Portugal uh, at a time when uh, the Portuguese uh, experience is especially interesting and um, in many ways especially successful. Uh, and he is now taking on one of the most difficult jobs uh, in Europe at a time of great moment for the continent. So we look forward very much to hearing what you have to say. And I was asked to announce that, that you're, uh, no one should be filming this particular episode. It's being live streamed, so um, it will be accessible to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here today. Uh, I'd like to, to thank you all to, for coming, especially Larry Katz, who was my advisor at Harvard, who taught me great things about labor economics. Uh, I was trained as a labor economist, and now I play all these rules in uh, financing <laughs> the, the economy. But uh, things are really uh, connected, uh, and it's all about economics. It is obviously a pleasure for me to be here at the Center for European Studies of Harvard University. Uh, it's good to be back uh, and to see uh, so many familiar faces and uh, this great place uh, which, is, which is Harvard. Uh, I obviously cherish, uh, cherish the memories of the time I spent here as a PhD student back in the late 90s and I have learned so much from colleagues, professors and friends that uh, I uh, really uh, cannot, cannot take that away. Uh, Harvard really taught me how to think of economics and politics together. At Harvard, I had the privilege to meet colleagues uh, with the same interests, but also those uh, who read different papers. I was truly enriched by that experience. And uh, I may say my interest in politics and economics remains uh, intact. Although politics has been stealing me probably far too much time lately, I uh, have to say to you that uh, I uh, was always inspired by uh, so many examples of Harvard professors and alumni that served in office. That sense of mission called me uh, in when uh, a chance to govern my country in a dire situation uh, 
was offered to me. I'm doing my share of serving. Uh, I come here today as a, an uh, alumni, as a Minister of Finance uh, and a President of the Eurogroup. And uh, I'm going to make best, my best effort to share with you uh, what uh, is being this uh, government experience to me. Before kicking off, I have to remember that uh, David Cutler always urges in seminars uh, to start by answering one question, which is, why should I care about this? Why <laughs> should you stay here and, and share uh, these thoughts uh, with me? Well, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about Portugal. Uh, and Portugal uh, has uh, had a successful recovery from the Euro crisis. This is a good story from both an economic perspective, but also from a political science perspective. And this is so because uh, it comes from a process of reforming of the economy. And uh, Portugal now is really benefiting from, from this process. For those with, uh, with an eye more on the political science dimension, this is uh, also a breakthrough uh, because we have uh, experienced lately in Portugal some new uh, political alliances in the context of southern European countries. And those are alliances that extended the platform of government to the left uh, of the political spectrum. And this is a novelty uh, in Portugal uh, and in many southern uh, European countries. The Portuguese economy and society have really endured a difficult period of adjustment. The kind of adjustment that occurs, hopefully, and this is what I really hope uh, it's going to be, once in a lifetime. We are still working to ensure a happy end to this story, but it really is looking pretty good so far. This is a story of a small, open economy in the context of a wider integration in a single currency area with a degree, substantial degree, of shared sovereignty. From a political economy perspective, the process of adjustment depends on a triplet. This is what I have been conveying to my colleagues in Brussels. We need to implement reforms. And reforms are meant to expand the supply conditions of the country, increase the potential growth of the country. But we also need a second dimension, and that is a business cycle and a fiscal policy. And these two dimensions are needed to feed the reform with what I often call demand. So we need the reforms to take care of supply, and we need this other dimension of demand. But there is a third dimension, and the third dimension is sometimes the more difficult one, which is time. And I translate time uh, in economics uh, by uh, the concept of being patient, which is, in Europe these days, the opposite of populism. Patience is indeed a key ingredient for a successful implementation of reforms. And the state in this small equation, this triplet, is the main supplier of such a precious asset. So we need these three dimensions. This triplet was not always taken on board in the European economy, economic policy debate. In a sense, and it was a very uh, ideological sense, this debate was, and I'm going to try to put it in the context of, 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 uh, of economic theory, this, this was, in some sense, a revival of Jean-Baptiste Say's famous result known as the Say's Law. All supply creates its own demand. This, this was what was feeding the debate uh, in Europe. But we know that... Uh, Jean-Baptiste was not right. And Europe focused too much on the first dimension of the triplet and woke up 
late, rather late, to the need for the whole set of policies. Arguably, it did so, it did not, it did not do so until Mario Draghi's famous statement, whatever it takes. And then things changed quite dramatically in Europe. In fact, Europeans came to believe that reforms were everything, and they arrived late to a solution for the financial crisis. That also increased the burden on national reform agendas, and we had to pursue national reform agendas that were much uh, tougher because, because of this. So let's then focus a little bit, focus a little bit on Portugal. Portugal, uh, after the, a decade of very, very low growth, in 2011, Portugal was mired in a deep recession and was blocked off markets. I'll explain how we got there in, 20, in, the, in the situation of 2011. And I will then proceed to explain in some detail how Portugal turned around. Finally, uh, I will walk you through the challenges we have before us, and I will put a little bit of Europe in the middle uh, of this digression. So to start with, how did Portugal became what so many called a sick man in Europe? Let me take you back to Portugal in the early 2000s. Portugal joined the European Union in 1986, a small, then closed economy, with very poor human capital, the country struggled to catch up with its European peers. While the US was experiencing what Larry called the century of education, the 20th century as a century of education, in 1982, only 2% of private sector workers in Portugal had a college degree, 2%. While in Massachusetts, education it is mandatory until the age of 12 since the late 19th century, in Portugal, we traveled all 20th century with three years of mandatory education, and that was for men only. It didn't apply to female workers. In 1986, strong public investment and domestic demand became prominent and were met by a European willingness to finance them. As a result, private debt increased remarkably. From 1995 to 2001, household debt rose from 52% to 118% of disposable income, and non-financial corporate debt from 81% to 150% of GDP. This was a remarkable increase uh, on uh, debt. The demand boost acted as a growth catalyst during this period. The average growth was 3.5, not bad, and pulled down the unemployment rate from 7.1% in 1995 to only 4% in 2001. I remember, and uh, Larry wasn't in the room, <laughs> In my last year uh, as a PhD student at Harvard, I presented a paper on self-employment in Portugal, uh, and the, the audience was uh, struck by the remarkably low level of unemployment in Portugal by then, which was 3.8%, uh, as low as the one in the best performing US states uh, at that time. However, this was not a sustainable pass. As, for example, the current account balance deteriorated from almost 0% balanced uh, situation of GDP in 1995 to minus 10% in 2001. Thus, in the early years of the 21st century, while other European countries experienced high growth rates, the Portuguese economy flattened. Between 2001 and 2008, the country grew at an average rate of 1%. Why did this happen? First, domestic demand weakened, both in terms of consumption and more worrisome investment. Second, the admission of China to the World Trade Organization in 2001 
and the enlargement of the European Union to Central and Eastern European countries in 2004 raised new challenges for Portuguese competitiveness. This came on top of weakening external competitiveness, truly a shock for the Portuguese economy. And third, during this period, Portugal borrowed vast amounts from abroad, which the domestic financial sector appears to have misallocated by channeling these foreign capital inflows to relatively unproductive, non-tradable sectors. When the 2008 global crisis came, Portugal was vulnerable. The country's economy could not cope with rising spreads and interest rates. This generated both a sovereign debt crisis and a bank crisis. Remember that the first reaction of Europe and the US to the crisis was to boost demand. But there was no fiscal space in some countries, and Portugal was one of them, to finance this boost in demand. So they entered into rising, indeed skyrocketing, fiscal deficits and public debt. In 2010, the deficit was 10% and more than 100% public debt. We have a, a public debt above 100% since that date. The results were indeed dramatic. Portugal was forced to turn on the European Union and the IMF for financial assistance, and that was doomsday. It was installed in Portugal, doomsday. And indeed, politics and, um, and the government entered into panic mode. GDP fell by almost 8%, employment declined by more than 13%, an employment surge from the 38 to 17.5% in 2013, and what was probably the most difficult uh, figure to face, nearly 500,000 people emigrated between 2011 and 2015. This is the largest emigration for, uh, flow uh, in the country in 50 years. The labor market contracted 14 quarters in a row. It is quite a, a dramatic figure, 14 quarters in a row of labor force reduction. And uh, I sometimes compare this uh, with, experience of, with countries experiencing a war, which was not the case. And no other country in Europe experienced such a reduction in the labor force. Actually, Portugal, had such as, uh, in terms of the dimension, reduction in the 60s uh, with the colonial war in Africa. Portugal bonds, to help to compose the, the picture, were downgraded to junk uh, in 2012. So you see the crisis was not really kind for Portugal. Today, uh, the script has changed. Today, Portugal is on the news again but this time for the good news, for the good reasons. The economy has picked up in a sustained way since the second half of 2016, 16, accelerating further to a 2.7 growth rate in 2017. This is finally above the European average. Investment and in employment increased in 2017 twice as much as the European Union average, while unemployment fell to 8%, its lowest level since 2008, and more importantly, the unemployment rate of prime age individuals was in 2017 5.7%. This is the most remarkable figure uh, that, 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 we, that we see today uh, in Portugal. And when I compare with Europe, uh, Europe is really in a very good mood, is in, it's growing, very much. Actually, the employment increase in Europe is the largest that the euro area countries experienced in many decades. Europe has gained, the euro area has gained more than 7 million jobs since 2013. So our comparison with Europe is really remarkable. On the fiscal front, we reached a fiscal deficit last year of 
This is above the average for the euro area. Public debt decreased four percentage points. It's still very large at 125% of GDP, but it is finally in a, a reduction path. The good economic results translated into policy and financial recognition. We exited the corrective arm of the European Union Stability and Growth Pact and regained investment grade rating for our bonds in 2017. With all this, can we now the Portugal uh, poster boy of Europe? This is the second part uh, of the title of, uh, of this seminar. Well, I do believe Portugal's recovery provides indeed a good example for Europe. When explaining how the economic situation evolved, I stated that Portugal was catching up in terms of human capital with the rest of Europe. Portugal is still dealing with this large stock of low-skilled workers, but is posting a very positive flow. From the 2% that I just mentioned before uh, of college graduates in, private, in the private sector in 82, we are now at 20%. This is still below the average for the stock, but the flow is indeed very close to the European uh, flow. And patience is again a key, a key ingredient. This is the result, this increase in human capital uh, is, result, is the result of reforms introduced uh, quite a long time ago in Portugal following the European Union accession in the education and training, and they are starting to pay off right now. We were not equipped that way in the crisis of the 80s following the intervention of the IMF in the early 80s because the educational system was not equipped for that. But today, we can take benefit uh, from, these, uh, from these reforms and uh, indeed uh, look to the future uh, in a different way. What was delayed in the early stages of the adjustment program was um, the, um, the challenges that were posed to the financial sector. We were truly late beginners on that. But one single measure of success that we can use right now is that we were the only European country in 2016, 2017, to be able to attract banking capital from all over the world. We attracted banking capital from the US, from China, from Africa, from Europe, indeed from all uh, four corners uh, of, of the world. Of course, challenges still remain, and uh, I will tackle them at the last part of my, uh, of my intervention. The national efforts in Europe, and Portugal is a good example of these efforts, make sense if they are properly framed in the euro area reform process. I believe that the discussion on euro area reform can also benefit from some comparisons with the US monetary union. We have a lot to learn from the US. Note that the institutional landscape in Europe, uh, and uh, this is a very important idea, is much more rough and harder than and incomplete, sorry, than the US. Also note that income convergence in Europe still lags the one witnessed in the US. I am going to propose you uh, some kind of a picture without a picture. Uh, if you take the income distribution uh, of each of the two monetary areas, the European Union and the US, there, are, there is a, a very interesting result, which is the following. In the call, in, in income inequality in the US is larger than in, the, than in Europe. It's larger also within states than in Europe. But inequality, between inequality, is much larger in Europe than it is in the US. If you plot the income distribution of the US stacking states on top of each other, this result uh, 
in a graph that uh, I often mention as the stripes, as in your national flag. They are very much uniformly distributed, while in Europe, it results in a totally skewed distribution to the, to the left, with low-income countries representing a disproportional share of low-income Europeans. This places a huge, huge challenge for policy making in Europe, because imagine that you are designing uh, even policy for the median income in the US. It really spreads all states roughly equally. In, the, in Europe, it is totally impossible to design such a policy because it will result in a quite different impact across countries. This is, of course, the result of a, a process of convergence in Europe that is more recently established uh, than, than in the US. Indeed, the euro is a currency that is still in its infancy. It's basically a toddler if you want to upgrade the euro a little bit more. But it is developing fast uh, and uh, has proven very resilient. So the euro is learning to be uh, uh, a relevant currency in a very difficult period of time. A few years after being born, it really faced a major global crisis. And it not only survived, but it grew stronger. But it was not prepared by, uh, at, at, at the early stages of the crisis to deal with it. It was not prepared. And it is still not prepared today. So we have a lot to do uh, in Europe. What were the main achievements of the euro uh, in, in the in terms of uh, both institutional and economic terms in, in the late, uh, in the, in the uh, recent past. At the institutional level, I want to highlight, highlight the following. We uh, have pulled common resources together to establish the European stability mechanism. This was a great breakthrough uh, for stability uh, in Europe. Uh, and we also uh, reinforced our common rules on macroeconomic and fiscal policies in the euro area, and those are also proving quite effective. Today, we have the, 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 the smallest ever uh, standard deviation of fiscal positions across euro area countries. And this uh, is a proof that, that the, the, this multilateral surveillance that we established in Europe is paying off, and we are more coordinated in that sense today than we have been since 95. Very importantly also, we set up a common regulation on, and supervision of financial institutions and of financial markets. And this also uh, Im improved the level playing field uh, for uh, banks across, across Europe. And more importantly, these measures are paying off so that economic growth in Europe today is uh, reality, and it also spreads across all countries in Europe. We are uh, at the euro area level in the 20th consecutive quarter of growth. We have been witnessing steady job creation. I just mentioned that uh, a while ago. And we have a positive external position. The euro area as a whole, as a whole, as a, uh, 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 an external um, surplus close to 3% of GDP. These are billions of euros in savings that, uh, that are available uh, in Europe. Indeed, we can say today that Europe is an engine of global growth, and uh, the euro proved its rule as a very important political project. This is recognized by citizens in Europe, although sometimes we think otherwise. Because if you go, if you consider the last uh, figures for the euro bar barometer available for the fall of last year, we have 74% of support for the euro project uh, in Europe. And this is very, this is very important. Of course, as I mentioned before, the reform is not yet over. 
And we need, again, to bring patients into the table. Because if you look back uh, at the history, the economic history of the US, the US took several decades uh, since the early periods to complete its banking union. And we just need to follow suite and, and complete ours, but it will take time. <laughs> so what does, just to finalize, what does the future bring for Portugal and Europe? And, uh, well, uh, I've been quite optimistic throughout all this uh, intervention. And let me, again, keep on that vein. Uh, I, I think we have identified in Europe the main engines of structural change. The Portuguese economy uh, is experiencing a very positive trend, both in terms of human capital and external competitiveness. You may not know, but uh, today uh, our students in Portugal have results in the OECD PISA tests that are above the, o the OECD average. They are beating the US, they are beating Germany, they are even beating some northern European countries that used to be the, the champions uh, of, of these tests. The current account uh, in Portugal has been in surplus for six years in a row, something that never happened in modern history uh, in Portugal. And uh, we are gaining market share. Our exports increase cons every year above the growth of imports of our main uh, customers, which means that Portugal is gaining market share in the global market. The fiscal front still requires attention, although we have been quite successful uh, at reducing the public, the public uh, deficit. Debt is still very high. And we can only look at the example, for example, for, as Be of Belgium, that between 95 and 2005 uh, reduced its debt from 130% to close to 80%. And that's, that's the, the, the type of trajectory that we need to sustain in Portugal. Uh, the financial sector still has some difficulties, especially in non-performing loans, but those are receding as well. Last year, uh, we reduced 20% the non-performing loans in the financial sector uh, in Portugal. And indeed, given that we are not isolated from the rest of Europe, we need to count on the reforms that Europe is designing to, to, to benefit uh, from that. In my final words, let me go back to my days at Harvard. I have uh, learned here as a student to be detailed in my research. I have learned the value of good and reliable data. As such, uh, now as a policymaker, uh, I always pursue the same method. Uh, when deciding policy, uh, we should base uh, our options really on hard data. Uh, before uh, before um, being elected as a member of parliament, uh, I presented in the electoral process a very detailed study, uh, which was a scenario for the development of the Portuguese uh, economy and public accounts uh, for the period 2015-2019. And uh, the good thing about this study is that this week I presented uh, to Parliament the stability program for the period 2018-2022, and in the overlapping period, the figures are the same. So we projected in 2015 that the primary surplus in Portugal in 2018 will be 2.8 percent of GDP, and today's figure is precisely 2.8. The same thing for 2019. 3.2% of GDP four years ago, the business case is working well. <laughs> and that is very good. Well, when coming back to, to my alma mater in Ar at Harvard, I uh, want, of course, to pay tribute to the lessons that I learned here. And believe me, uh, I do my best 
to keep up with the lessons I learned at Harvard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Centeno. Um, uh, in view of how accurate your uh, scenario predictions were, I'm reminded uh, that of the uh, familiar definition of an economist as a person who, if you've forgotten your telephone number, will estimate it for you. And uh, <laughs> I feel I have to say that as a kind of um, a, a contrapuntal theme here. Uh, so we have some time for questions and comments. I'd like to give priority to uh, students and faculty members. I'll try and do that. Uh, if you have a question um, or comment, please keep it moderately brief and uh, identify yourself, if you wouldn't mind, when you ask it. And, and maybe I can abuse the privilege of the chair to ask you the first question. Um, uh, if we think about the many proposals for uh, reform to strengthen the Eurozone, of, uh, and, and uh, there's a fairly long list, but it would include uh, turning the European stability mechanism into something like a European monetary fund. It might include completing banking union with um, deposit insurance. Could include creating a European uh, finance minister. It could include uh, to improve coordination, fiscal coordination. It could include um, uh, uh, perhaps giving the uh, uh, eurozone some kind of central fiscal capacity, uh, counter-cyclical capacity. We think about that list, or maybe a slightly longer list. Um, as best you can judge, what do you think is the highest priority uh, on that list for uh, the coming three or four years? I hope it's a difficult question, but not too difficult a question that you can't say anything about. <laughs> In public, you mean? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Okay. We we can we we can look at the the challenges we have. Um, You'll need to uh, speak more closely in the okay. mic. I think. Sorry. So that it, yeah, we're getting okay. We have a lot. We have lots of ideas around the table. Believe me, it's uh, it's a uh, wealth of ideas that we have been discussing uh, in in uh, at the Eurogroup level. Uh, my role now is to be the coordinator uh, of, uh, of uh, 19, uh, counting with me, <laughs> um, finance ministers, and this is a difficult task, but uh, I'll, I'll go straight to, 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 to the point you, 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 you asked me. Uh, I think we need to complete the banking union for sure. Uh, there are still a uh, few uh, things that um, that uh, uh, we need to, to to implement, but we cannot be complacent about it because uh, I also discussed a lot with uh, Carmen Reinhardt and others uh, on whether the banking union itself will be a panacea, and uh, it it is not by itself and only uh, on itself uh, a solution. We need to go uh, further. Uh, and we are willing to discuss those issues. So completing the banking union uh, uh, and the third pillar, which, uh, which is the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, is certainly uh, a must go, uh, although we probably need, uh, as uh, Europeans usually do, establish a, a phased uh, uh, implementation process. But uh, uh, we also uh, need to look at uh, fiscal, fiscal issues uh, at uh, the, the European level uh, as another dimension uh, of priority. The, 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 the figures that I uh, described when I compared the um, uh, inequality and within and between inequality uh, uh, in the US and Europe across states and countries uh, can only be changed uh, if we have uh, some extra degree uh, of uh, integration in, in fiscal terms. So those will be the great tool. Thank you very much. Floor is open. Uh, you don't look like a student, but I'll go to you anyway. So, uh, please, uh, please identify yourself. Uh, if you take Greece, oh, pardon me. I if think take, this is Richard Friedman. Yes, it is. <laughs> if you take Greece as a, 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 not a successful poster boy, and you take Portugal as a success, what would you be saying to the Greeks that 
they should be doing to learn from you? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, wow. Uh, no, the, the, the answer, I, I, I'm going to be very, very, very short, and then I can, I can go in a little bit more of detail. Ownership. You need to take to re regain ownership uh, on the old process. Politically, this is absolutely key, uh, and it's the only possibility for you to, to show that there are alternatives. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to complain uh, <laughs> before this audience uh, on, on how difficult it were my first months <laughs> in office, but uh, uh, we were really uh, very much uh, uh, questioned uh, on, on the decisions that we were uh, implementing. And I cited quite often a sentence that you wrote in a paper that the, that the minimum wage debate is a debate around zero. Uh, because we were really beaten, <laughs> because we were increasing the minimum wage in Portugal uh, after a long period uh, of... Uh, uh, of uh, 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 stagnation and um, and uh, difficulties in the labor market that were very much connected with the out migration process that we experienced. So regain ownership, uh, take uh, control uh, of uh, of the old process, uh, and uh, and have alternatives for for what is uh, uh, on the table and being discussed. If you really work. Uh, on all the details of this alternative, uh, I think you eventually, uh, Portugal did so, uh, so I think Greeks can also do the same, uh, can pursue this, uh, uh, this, um, this uh, domestic uh, process uh, to, 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 to the future, to, to, be, uh, to be an alternative to, to the general view. Yes, uh, Andrew Martin. Uh, I, I, there's a, the microphone will come to you, and oh, okay. uh, that way uh, people in the wider world will, will hear you. Thank you. Okay, Andrew Martin from the Center for European Studies. Uh, uh, you stressed uh, the importance of uh, not only supply side reforms, but the, of demand to make them effective, to make them work. Essentially, what economists used to talk about a two handed policy approach. Um, and you also mentioned that the initial response in Europe to the crisis was to stimulate demand, was a, a expansionary fiscal policy. But then, of course, that stance was abandoned and uh, fisc the pressures for uh, uh, contractionary fiscal policy were intensified by uh, uh, European authorities. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the Portuguese recovery uh, and the exploitation of the gains from the reforms would have come more quickly if uh, European policy had continued to stimulate demand as it did in, in its initial response to the crisis. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's a difficult counterfactual. <laughs> uh, it's a very difficult one. Uh, if you go back to, to the early stages of the crisis, you, th there are some events that really strike uh, the analysis, the, the, any analysis that you may, may do. For example, in, in August 2008, the European Central Bank was raising interest rates from 5 to 5.5%. Uh, so, what characterizes the reaction of Europe to the crisis was uh, a stagger process. Uh, uh, we were really, um, it took quite a long time for Europe to get the right uh, measures to, to address what was indeed a financial crisis uh, and the consequences for that. Uh, for Demand collapse. And demand collapsed. Exactly. Exactly. So it's it's um, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, uh, my view on that is that you really need to take into account the three the three dimensions and certainly the two sided 
supply because reforms, supply side reforms are very important in many aspects and were very important in many countries in Europe. And so we cannot, uh, we cannot avoid to continue in that, in that sense. But then you need the other two dimensions. And time here is very important because in, a, in, in, in given that we, uh, that we have shared uh, so sovereignty over many issues in Europe already, uh, it's, the time dimension is also uh, to, needs to be understood as a way the stability and growth pact is applied. Uh, the coherence of the way we do implement it, because we have to implement it, but we have to be wise implementing it. So um, it's a little bit of a combination of all these, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, the, the main aspect that I wanted to highlight is that we, we were very, uh, it took quite a bit of time for us to, uh, to, to respond to the financial dimension of the crisis. Yes, uh, right there. Please identify yourself. Hi, um, I'm Gil Hyatt. I'm a senior at the college studying history. Um, I'm trying to figure out what has been happening with Eurozone growth over the last couple of months. Uh, particularly, do you think that it, the economy is actually slowing down? Uh, and if so, do you have uh, thoughts as to why? Thank you. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a different dimension. <laughs> Uh, we um, we are not uh, um, we are not still having. Um, uh, uh, let, let me let me start by saying the following: um, inflation in Europe is very much subdued already for a long period of time. That has to do with the nature of the financial crisis, but also. Uh, in some labor markets uh, to the immigration process that is containing wages and wage pressures in, in several uh, labor markets. The economic indicators that we know recently uh, in Europe do not point to a um, deceleration of growth uh, in general terms, uh, although uh, some indicators may be uh, pointing out to, uh, to specific uh, uh, notes of deceleration. I won't take it, and we don't have, uh, we don't have a, a, a view that, uh, that, that those indicators will lead uh, into that uh, direction anyway. Are there any women? Yes, there are, right in the middle there. Thank you. Uh, Ines Fernandes, uh, first year student at Harvard College. Um, so in one of the Portuguese newspapers, uh, Jornal de Negócios, they quoted you uh, saying that... Um, you might have to speak just a little louder. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, that um, the political reforms of the previous party, of the previous government, um, were well intentioned, but in a context, in the context of crisis, uh, they could actually like have potential um, economic and social um, disadvantages. So I was just wondering, uh, in your opinion, uh, what do you think that the previous government, um, what were the policies that they implemented in a wrong way, and what would have been a better alternative? What are some of the things that they could have done better? <clears throat> Well, this is again a very difficult counterfactual. <laughs> I, I think we can we can look back uh, and uh, and try to figure out w what could have been done differently. Uh, and um, uh, to be totally honest with you, uh, I think uh, uh, expectations were very poorly managed. Uh, there was a, a sense of austerity uh, that then was translated into panic mode decisions that were not very uh, well taken. I, I, uh, I'm going to give you an example of how this did materialize. Uh, it, the, the previous government uh, took quite some time to understand the origins uh, of unemployment. Unemployment in Portugal 
raised to 17.5% because I rings were cut by more than a half. It was not because of a spurt of uh, uh, separations and drop destruction. It was because I rings were basically uh, halved vis-à-vis uh, -vis the previous the previous period, which was actually something similar to what happened in the U.S. Um, and the answer for to to such a phenomenon is quite different from uh, what would have happened uh, if uh, if the uh, the, we were uh, observing uh, substantial uh, uh, destruction uh, of existing of existing jobs. Uh, from here, we can uh, write down a completely different, eventually, <laughs> plan. But uh, it was on the understanding of what was going on that that we were really uh, missing uh, the the big picture. Yeah, said up right there. Mafalda, uh, HVS student. I think my question relates a bit to to that question and also the question on Greece, which is how much do you think the ownership that you said was very hard to conquer was um, in a way related to the previous government and their also difficult ownership in making those hard decisions? I, I, the, the, the problem the, the problem with managing uh, a given dramatic and difficult situation uh, is uh, how well prepared you are to deal with that. Uh, do you understand, as we were mentioning before, the reasons for for the slowdown or for the crisis or for the and, and most of the time we don't uh, put enough effort. Uh, in doing that, uh, so it's it, it it will it will it will not be fair from my side to say, well, uh, the thing was easy <laughs> to deal with, and uh, the, there were a couple of mistakes or lots of mistakes. It's not the point. The point is uh, the what we were um, uh, the, the way we were uh, facing each of the difficulties. And, and remember that, that we were under the umbrella of an economic and adjustment and uh, financial adjustment program, uh, and that is to be used to implement uh, specific measures. Uh, and my more, most clear answer to you is uh, that was not properly used uh, as much as uh, it could have been. And uh, the major example that I can give you is precisely the financial sector. When, when, when I took office as, as, as finance minister uh, in, in uh, November 2015, uh, we had 75% uh, of the, the banking assets were in banks that were either under resolution about to enter into resolution without uh, capital, so undercapitalized, uh, and this is this is a major problem uh, for an economy uh, that the financial sector is not really uh, taken care of. The U.S. did exactly the opposite in terms of priorities. Uh, many European countries also, but we unfortunately didn't follow that path. George Alagoskov from Fletcher uh, at Tufts University and a former finance minister. So let me congratulate you for, for being the president of the Eurogroup, the first economist to be the president of the Eurogroup, I would say, <laughs> <laughs> which is good. Uh, I would like to uh, ask a question about Europe. You mentioned the, the current account surplus that the euro area has. Now, we know that this current account surplus is due part in, to one country, Really, maybe maybe two economies. So, so for me, this current account surplus is a problem rather than a than a than a strong point of the euro area because it shows something that we 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 saw before the crisis, but also after the crisis, 
that there are major macroeconomic asymmetries in the euro area. Now, Peter Hall asked some questions about you know, what we should do about those asymmetries. Uh, do you think that the current macroeconomic policy stands in the euro area? I know it's difficult for you to answer because of your position, but, <laughs> but do, you, do you think that the current macroeconomic policy stands not of Portugal or Greece or Italy, or, but the overall macroeconomic policy stance is responsible for this current account surplus that Germany has? <laughs> you named the game. Well, the, I was being optimistic and positive about it. Uh, of course, because I am the president of the Eurogroup. Uh, also because um, it is important to know what to do about it and how we can really do something about it. Um, and uh, I really believe that if we uh, uh, are able to complete the banking union, to uh, complete the capital markets union, that this uh, wealth of savings that we accumulate in Europe, and let me again <laughs> use the <laughs> umbrella of Europe, can be invested in Europe, can be uh, made... Uh, with the benefit uh, of, of, of Europeans. Uh, but it's true that, that we need to, to, to work to, towards uh, rebalancing these macroeconomic uh, policies uh, in a way that, uh, that these uh, can be made um, a reality. Uh, it's, uh, for the euro area as a whole, certainly is a positive development. This, this means that the, the euro area is, is in a much better position than other large economic and monetary areas to face the future. But this is only true if we can indeed uh, complement this with uh, further reforms. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just follow that up um, with a very similar uh, question? And you may or may not be able to answer this, although I've asked many economists this. You, if we think that current account imbalances across the member states of the euro um, are a, a serious issue, uh, there are kind of two approaches uh, to them. What, one would be to demand that countries that are running deficits uh, correct themselves and eliminate those deficits, which um, often requires relatively austere domestic policies. The other alternative would be to suggest that, contrary to some uh, common sense propositions, the Eurozone might well be able to run uh, uh, surpluses and deficits uh, for an indefinite period. I mean, in this country, we have some um, understanding of uh, how you defy the laws of gravity and uh, run current account deficits for um, decades and decades. Uh, I'm, I, this is a genuine question in my mind. I, I wonder if we couldn't imagine, especially with a somewhat better uh, banking union and maybe uh, some uh, movement on the other uh, side of equ equity markets and the like, if we couldn't imagine a eurozone in which some countries run surpluses and other countries run deficits for the indefinite future and that that could be a perfectly stable arrangement. Could, could that be a perfectly stable arrangement or am I... Uh, in a some sense, uh, d defying the laws of economics with that thought. <laughs> um, I think that with, with the current uh, instruments that we have uh, in the euro area, that, that is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So you need, you need further uh, I instruments. Um, and uh, one possibility to, to, uh, to avoid... Uh, to avoid uh, a strong movement of integration uh, in the euro area that politically is certainly difficult uh, at this stage, uh, is to, uh, as I was uh, answering before, to, to, for you to complete this, uh, what I call the land, institutional landscape, to allow for the savings to be invested within the euro area uh, in uh, alternative uh, uh, opportunities that for sure will be available 
uh, in the area because one of the big challenges for countries that accumulate those savings is uh, how to make something out of them because those savings need to, to have some uh, return uh, uh, for the savers. <laughs> and, uh, and this is also a challenge for those countries. Uh, and if we think of it together, uh, it will make things much easier than otherwise. Um, maybe right, right in the middle there, the second row. Hi, uh, I'm Manuel. I'm a student at the college studying economics. Um, with um, the IMF forecasting more greater risks to, to economic growth, given a more protectionist US stance in trade disputes with China and even uh, at some point with the EU, um, do you think that in terms of mon monetary policy, uh, the ECB has kept uh, interest rates very low for a very long time? Should we have a shock? Do you think we're well prepared to to use that to, uh, given that it's been it's been like we've had very low very low rates for for such a long time now? Mm, your, your question is, uh, what is the interplay between if, trade? Like if if we have some sort of like uh, less positive economic outlook going forward, are we ready to deal with that from the point of view of econ of monetary policy? If Given that we've we've had very low interest rates for a very for a very long time, I mean it's a it's a very important debate that macroeconomists, <laughs> more specialized in in monetary policy than myself, uh, uh, have already for quite some time, uh, and um, certainly we all look forward for interest rates to to go up. But uh, as I mentioned before, inflation is really not uh, taking off uh, in Europe uh, yet. Uh, and there are good reasons for that to happen and bad reasons, but uh, it's what it is. Uh, so uh, certainly a, a, a shock, a negative shock uh, in, the, in this context uh, will be much uh, more difficult to deal with. That's, that's for sure. Uh, if, if we have room uh, I think it, it is up to the ECB to, to respond. I mean, you know, uh, finance ministers do not <laughs> comment on monetary policy, but, uh, but uh, uh, we, we will need to, to be prepared to that. Uh, there is certainly the ECB uh, has that uh, uh, studied, well studied, but uh, a, different, a different path. Uh, for interest rates, uh, if sustained <laughs> on economic growth, uh, will be very much welcomed in Europe, for sure. There's a question here in the front row. Yeah. For the talk, my name is Luis Paixão. I'm a research fellow at Mass General Hospital. And I have two questions. Uh, one um, is to do with the social welfare system. So I think that's something that Europeans really uh, cherish and, and benefit from. However, given the aging of the population and decreased costs of the healthcare, how can Portugal and Europe keep providing uh, a good quality social uh, welfare system? And my second question is to do with um, the basic, the universal basic income, and what are your views uh, regarding the universal basic income? Thank you. Well, the, the demographics is, uh, is, is one of the big challenges and uh, we, we, we need to face, uh, face it. Politically, it's a very difficult uh, uh, issue uh, because uh, certainly it also touches upon um, a debate on migration uh, that, that Europe needs to, to, to undertake. Uh, and um, we, uh, we've been asking a lot in terms of reform also uh, on, on, at the national level uh, and also in Portugal uh, on the national health uh, system. Uh, and this is common uh, across Europe. It's very, very important that, uh, that we... Uh, uh, take all these debates together 
and I don't see personally uh, a way out uh, if that is not the case uh, and uh, uh, if uh, Europe uh, closes uh, uh, the borders and uh, do not uh, take this in a very uh, comprehensive way, uh, the, the challenge will be even only, it, it can only be high, uh, larger uh, in, in, in the future. So uh, uh, it is, it is a very difficult issue. Uh, the, the, the UBI, we, know, we don't know a lot about it. And uh, we don't know a lot uh, about uh, how it works, in fact. Um, and uh, uh, from, from that perspective, uh, I think uh, we are still far from adopting, I mean, in a generalized way, uh, when such a measure uh, in any European country. There are some experiences uh, going on in Finland and in the Switzerland. Uh, we don't know much about the results uh, of those experiments. Uh, we uh, are eager to learn from them, uh, but uh, from a political perspective, I, I don't see uh, any perspective in the medium term for that to be adopted. Okay, we can go to the second row there. Boa tarde. Um, my name is Johnny. I'm a Portuguese student at the Kennedy School. Um, at the beginning of your intervention, uh, you talk about the work done by Reinhardt and Rogoff. And when you look at these, these papers, uh, there is a tight connection between sovereign debt crisis and banking crisis. And in your intervention, you didn't um, mention what's happening with the Caixa Geral Depósitos and, uh, and, um, and the Banco Espírito Santo. And my question is, don't you think that what's happening with these two banks and the amount of capital that the government has been injected into the banking sector and the Portuguese banking sector in general could jeopardize everything that has been done so far, both by your executive and the population? I mean, a banking crisis could put Portugal in a very complicated situation, and it's not clear to me what will happen to um, Caixa Geral Deposits and Novo Bank or Banco Espírito Santo going, going forward. Well, we all know that, that uh, in some countries uh, there was um, a connection between uh, the sovereign debt crisis and the banking uh, crisis. Uh, the, the Portuguese case uh, is uh, the Portuguese financial sector and banking sector, today it is pretty much capitalized and stable. Uh, this was the result uh, of a capital increase in Caixa Geral Deposits. Caixa Geral Deposits, for those that uh, don't know, is the largest bank in Portugal and is a public-owned uh, um, bank. Uh, and uh, the state, uh, as owner of the bank, uh, capitalized it. Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, now with... a. Uh, uh, a business plan, a new business plan, and uh, it is uh, successfully implementing that business plan. And the latest numbers that uh, were made public uh, show that uh, actually the business plan is one year ahead of time, meaning that uh, it was possible to turn the situation of the bank around and, uh, and, and to be a success. Novo Banco, which is the... Uh, it started to be this transition bank of the resolution of Banco Espírito Santo, which uh, was then the third largest bank in Portugal, uh, is now with a new owner. Uh, it's uh, actually a uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, owner, uh, and it is also uh, sufficiently capitalized to deal uh, with uh, the challenges of restructuring that it still needs to, to, uh, to comply with. Which means that um, when I now, today I look at the financial sector and the banking sector in Portugal and I don't really see uh, the difficulties uh, we had 
a couple of years ago. Of course, um, the dealing with the financial sector is a job that is uh, always unfinished, <laughs> and uh, you need to keep up with the uh, uh, supervision uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, all, all sorts of. Uh, um, uh, Monitoring that that uh, that can uh, avoid uh, Europe and uh, Portugal to go uh, over the difficulties that that we experienced. It's important to to, to also know to notice that some of the issues, uh, not all the issues, but some of the issues that happened in the banking sector in Portugal was were due to mismanagement and. Uh, uh, and that, of course, uh, we um, we uh, need to uh, try. We we can hopefully uh, avoid to happen again due to the establishment of this uh, uh, single supervisor mechanism in Europe that um, established a new level playing field for major institutions uh, in Europe, and uh, hopefully that that brings. Uh, further stability for the whole banking sector in Europe in the future. Let me go to the gentleman in the middle there on the third row. Uh, Rio Bukerke from Boston College. Um, hello, hello. Mario. Um, you talked about a, uh, a lot about patience, and uh, when we write models, we don't. Uh, patience is not one of the things that we typically think about, but. So I'd like you to you know, speak a little bit more to that. Um, and perhaps maybe you can talk about patience in the context of what, whatever you can say of the actions that the ECB is still taking with respect to uh, you know, bond buying programs. And uh, perhaps if that goes away, the markets will be not as patient and the ECB uh, has been uh, towards some countries, including Portugal. And so if that's what you're talking about patience, or you know, if that's a politician talking about patience and needing more time. Thank you. <laughs> it is pretty much a political dimension. <laughs> you, you don't you don't like to see politicians being uh, anxious people, <laughs> because it really is a traumatic experience. Um, and uh, but uh, going a little bit deeper into the con into the concept, uh, what uh, what I uh, wanted to say uh, is that we need to make reforms. We need to stand by those reforms, and then we need to uh, allow, allow allow doing this. We need to allow reforms to experience the old business cycle, and uh, met the demand that will make those reforms uh, fruitful for for the population that endured uh, these these reforms. It is there is a very interesting mechanism. Uh, in, in, in Europe vis-à-vis -vis this dimension of patience, and I'm going, uh, let, let's see if I can explain to you very briefly. When a country implements reforms, uh, uh, typically those reforms have a, a, a recessionary impact in the early stages. Um, this implies that uh, in the accounts that European Commission does of potential output, the potential output of the country falls immediately after the reform. A fa this fall in potential output re implies that the Commission then asks the country to take fiscal measures to, uh, to, to accommodate, the, in terms of the fiscal position of the country, the recessionary impact of the reforms that the Commission was uh, uh, promoting uh, in the country. And this is a very, I mean, impossible, this is impossible to explain politically. So that's where the patient comes. What, is the pro what, what can be an alternative? Well, uh, an institution like the European Commission proposes a given reform. Uh, it has an impact on the potential output of the country. Otherwise, it's worthless to uh, follow that that uh, to implement that reform. Uh, so this, uh, it, was, it would have been natural for the European Commission to add, instead of subtract, this into the potential growth of the country. And this will make it much more easier uh, 
uh, and you will have a, uh, an institution uh, that will be patient for that reform to have an effect, to mature, and uh, eventually, if uh, econ economists were right to, <laughs> to, to promote that reform, uh, to, for it to, to, to be, uh, to be uh, implemented. Uh, well, you have some mechanisms for that in Europe already, but the general sense is pretty much more algorithmic, uh, and this is a very strong political problem. So yes, you don't have that in your models, but <laughs> politically it's a very important dimension for it. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we go right there? Sebastian Rojo from Suffolk University. I have two, two questions. I mean, one, um, I'm going to be raining a little bit on the parade. Um, there are many people out there that claim that what has happened in Portugal and other countries in Southern Europe is not so much as a result of the reforms that have been implemented, but as a result of external factors like low interest rates, low prices, um, cheap credit that are a product of the moment, but that are likely to change in the near future, and that these countries are not really ready for that moment, and that it's questionable how sustainable the growth that you have described is, particularly in the context of the very delicate and fragile fiscal position. So I wonder if you can comment on that criticism. And then connected to that, there has been a lot of discussion also in Europe and elsewhere about austerity and the politics of austerity. Um, people have been critical. You have mentioned some of the negative effects of the austerity policy. But it's not clear that the proponents of austerity, particularly in, in Germany, um, are really convinced that austerity policies have not worked. So for the next crisis, do you feel any sense of confidence that we've learned anything and that we will do something different? Well. Low, low interest rates uh, are endogenous economically, right? They, they are the, the, the result uh, of uh, difficulties that we had in the financial uh, sector and in the economy that, um, that uh, were uh, met in terms of the policy response. Uh, by low and uh, lowering uh, the, the, the interest rate. So uh, I really don't see very well the counterfactual of having higher interest rates set at this party was because, uh, I mean, it doesn't make much sense to think uh, on that front, at least. Um, uh, I mean, from a purely uh, uh, exercise of, uh, a pure exercise of increasing interest rates, keeping everything else con constant. Uh, I do think that, um, uh, uh, certainly, the policy response of the ECB, and uh, especially the whatever it takes <laughs> uh, uh, sentence by Mario Draghi, uh, had a very substantial increase uh, uh, impact uh, in the in uh, uh, the confidence uh, that uh, the markets and investors uh, uh, have uh, on. Uh, on, on the euro area, on the euro, uh, and uh, uh, on about buying um, uh, euro area debt. So um, we need we need to 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 work uh, uh, in each country, and we are doing our job in Portugal uh, within the instruments we have uh, to uh, to be prepared. To a change in, uh, in 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 the interest rate cycle, if it is to um, uh, to begin uh, at some point in the future, uh, we uh, right now uh, in Portugal our uh, ten-year bond, uh, the interest rate is lower than the U.S., than Canada, than Australia. Uh, this means for sure that we can expect in the future it to, to increase. Um, but uh, 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 this is precisely the game we have to play. We have to be ready for that moment when, when it comes. With respect to the, to the policy of the, of the ECB uh, about buying um, uh, sovereign uh, debt, 
it is important to note that uh, the um, reduction uh, in the uh, buying uh, process of on these uh, on Portuguese bonds uh, is uh, already uh, being being implemented because uh, if we compare uh, what was the amount of bonds uh, of Portuguese debt that the ECB was buying at the beginning of the program and today the 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 amount uh, today is about uh, less than 50% of what it used to be uh, in the beginning of the program so uh, we can easily say that uh, this is already priced in uh, in our uh, interest rates today uh, maybe not in other countries because for other countries this is not true. This is this is uh, this is the result of the of the structure of the Portuguese debt. It's not a policy. I mean, it's a policy decision, but it is the consequence uh, of the structure of Portuguese debt uh, that there there are not uh, enough. There is not enough uh, uh, Portuguese debt in the market for the ECB to buy. Uh, but uh, indeed, the impact. The amounts that uh, that are being uh, at this stage uh, involved in the in this ECB policy regarding Portugal are much much lower than than they used to be, uh, which means that uh, we need to take into account that when we evaluate the impact uh, of further reductions for Portugal in the future. I think we might have enough time for two questions if we just took two together, if that would be okay. all right. Very good. Um, uh, maybe we'll go to the at the very back there. Um, and I, I already apologize to those of you who are not going to get to. Hello. Um, I'm Roberto from HPS. Um, so my question is about the fact that the process of regaining competitiveness in a monetary union is a very painful and long process. And many people argue that, to some extent, if, if Portugal and Greece, for instance, had had the, the lever of devaluation, the process would have been much easier, harmonious, uh, less painful for the population. And so, um, obviously, we all understand the political reason for, for not doing such a move and for keeping the euro in those countries. But I wanted, I wanted to ask you if you could make the economic argument why it was a good it was a good thing to, to, you know, to make the people endure such an adjustment uh, in order to keep the, the currency. What were the, the, ultimately, what was the net gain economically for, for, for making such a decision? Thank you. Okay, so hold that thought. And so why don't we go to the middle row here? Yeah, yeah. I am uh, Eduard. I'm an economics PhD here at Harvard. Uh, so my question is quite uh, fun in some sense as opposed to the last one because uh, uh, I'm Italian, I'm working on Portuguese data, so I'm trying to understand a bit of the labor market and I'm working on something that you Good actually luck. dealt with in your, uh, in your research, which is a dualism of the labor market and this uh, stark contrast that we have in Europe uh, between uh, these temporary and uh, permanent contracts. When I look at the crisis, I tend to think at times that actually in some sense, uh, Portugal was lucky, and don't uh, uh, get me wrong on that, uh, in having the Troika because it actually compelled it to reform a bit the labor market, for instance, in an incredible way, which is something that Italy, for instance, has completely refrained from doing, apart from very scarce reforms recently. And also from a fiscal standpoint, for instance, Italy would have needed very much to uh, start decreasing the amounts of debt. So I actually tend to think that in some sense, in the long run, we are going to suffer because of that. And I think that Portugal actually is in some sense maybe benefiting a bit uh, of the uh, reforms that it had to uh, undertake uh, because of the memorandum of agreements with the uh, Troika. So I wanted to know what is your opinion about that. Those two questions go together pretty well. So. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> Uh, and very interesting. Uh, let, let's see if I can give um, uh, a short but uh, insightful uh, answer. Y you mentioned precisely that um, regaining competitiveness, uh, it's a long process. Well, there's patience there. <laughs> you really need to be very patient to, to, to reform, uh, 
to see the impact, to uh, observe the consequences of the reforms you make. Uh, I am not a big fan uh, of uh, adjustments on the nominal side of the economy. Let me be clear, this is maybe a personal view. Uh, they don't last much. <laughs> you, 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 you fall again uh, in the same type of miseries <laughs> after, uh, after some time if you don't really do the real thing. Uh, and doing the real thing is sometimes harmful. Uh, that's why uh, there is... Uh, uh, there is... Uh, uh, economic, um, uh, political economy arguments in each of these reforms. Um, and those political economy arguments uh, were in some cases, um, well uh, interpreted and implemented during the adjustment program uh, in Portugal, but in some other cases not. Uh, I, uh, I am very critical uh, on, on the uh, priorities that were uh, taken during the adjustment program again, because precisely because of the uh, uh, view that nominal uh, adjustments uh, are, uh, are uh, more uh, are easier to implement or are more effective in the short term. Uh, a, a large focus of the Portuguese program was placed on wage flexibility. And uh, uh, unfortunately, and given that we are uh, uh, in a university, I think I can say so, uh, it was based on wrong data, totally wrong data. Wage flexibility in Portugal is uh, as uh, strong uh, as in the US or as in, in, uh, in the UK. Uh, you may be surprised by this, but this is what the hard data tells you about wage flexibility. Uh, each year in Portugal of continuing jobs uh, in, during the crisis, more than 30% of wages were cut of continuing jobs. Uh, and, and this is something that it's hard to see uh, in very flexible, so-called very flexible labor markets. Uh, and so the focus sometimes uh, in these adjustment programs uh, is misplaced. So the Troika is not always nice. Uh, but uh, uh, it certainly helps the can a country to, again, uh, the answer I started with about Greece, take ownership of what you want to implement uh, and have a very clear idea uh, of what are the true bottlenecks uh, of, uh, of, your, of your economy. Portugal implemented two major labor reforms, one in 2009, which according to the OECD indicator, uh, it was even uh, stronger in terms of increasing flexibility than the one implemented in 2012. And these reforms certainly have something to do with the fact that last year, the Portuguese economy gained 5% uh, more salaried workers than the year before. This is a quite impressive increase in employment uh, in a single year in, in a country like Portugal, 5%. I mean, it's, it's a unique, almost a unique event. Um, it's, uh, it's important uh, to understand the connection between those, the, the reforms and, and the results. But uh, um, uh, above all, uh, you need to clearly uh, uh, understand what are the the, the, the bottlenecks. Vis-a-vis, -vis, you are studying fixed-term contracts in Portugal. Uh, again, uh, quart in, on a quarterly basis, flows in the Portuguese economy are only uh, slightly lower than the ones in the US. And this is precisely because of dualism, because all this uh, rotation is concentrated on fixed-term contracts that rotate at a 
very, very high speed. And then you have this permanent contract share of the population in which indeed uh, rotation is much lower. Is this efficient? Do you care about the overall rate or the composi composition of, uh, of flows? It's, it's important to, 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 answer, to answer this. Uh, and um, uh, most of the time, this is not present in the debate uh, around uh, economic and financial adjustment programs. <laughs> so uh, we, we better do uh, at home uh, our work uh, and certainly I do understand uh, your feeling on, on the Italian and Portuguese and French and Spanish economies, but uh, we, we need really to, to look at uh, carefully at, at what, what are the priorities. And long processes require firm decisions, I mean, uh, that we stand by the decisions we take, uh, and, uh, and that's the definition of patience. Thank you. So, uh, Minister Centeno, thank you very much for your um, uh, insightful remarks, for your wide-ranging responses to questions. And I think I speak for everyone in the room when I say we wish you success on the Portuguese <laughs> level and also on the European level. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much.